so I wanted to start today by just taking a moment to acknowledge uh, the presenters and, and colleagues that you interacted with today. So if you take a moment in the chat, uh, add something that you learned, someone that inspired you, or someone you learned from today. And I've already seen some great quotes out there. Feel free to add those. But I really wanted to start with a bit of gratitude uh, and just acknowledging uh, being a part of the community today. Uh, and I thought I would just recognize my gratitude. First, I wanted to thank the organizers of this event. A lot of work goes into this, and we often don't take a moment to thank them. So thanks to our engagement team and everyone else who, who put this event together. Uh, and I actually wanted to take a moment to thank Alex Kajitani. Today was my first day uh, experiencing him and, and his energy, and it was awesome. I love starting with a teacher voice. I just think that's so powerful. Uh, that's really where that direct connection with learners comes from. And when I think about my own education, it wasn't a great curriculum or a great assessment that really changed my life. It was great teachers. And so I think it's so important for us to start with teachers and that teacher voice as, as we go. Uh, a couple of things that stood out to me with what, what he included there were, uh, some of them were language oriented. I really love that the word high poverty uh, was shifted to culturally rich communities. I just think there's so much power in language. So changing the, the language there is really notable. Uh, and I also love the idea of being creative and making room for mistakes. I think when we're modeling in front of kids, we often wanna do things perfectly. And I, uh, I still have this song in my head, line up the dot and give it all you got. Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna give it all I've got for you here today too uh, and bring that energy. But I think there's something to the memorable moments that kids have that is often when teachers make mistakes, but teach, uh, but kids know they care. And so that investment in trying to do something creative uh, is, is wonderful. So, um, so tons of gratitude there. And I'm just looking at the chat uh, and, and it's uh, lots of impactful things for all of you too. So uh, thank you. And my last bit of gratitude is to you all. I know you're very busy and joining us here today is, is taking time out of your day. And I hope you're getting the value out of it. Uh, while I won't be wrapping, uh, I uh, also hope this isn't one of those keynotes, uh, as Alex mentioned. And you might be thinking, I thought this was an ST Math Users Conference. Why are we talking about the world's most challenging problems in a global digital world? Uh, but I think it's important to step back a little bit and think big picture. And at Mind Education, this is particularly important uh, because of our mission, which I'll get into more here in a moment. As Deb mentioned, I started off as a teacher. And so I think from an instructional point of view, and I'll share with you, I had a very seminal moment. Uh, my very first year teaching, uh, I was teaching seniors in high school uh, in English, in what I was affectionately referring to as English for kids who don't love English. And it was kids who were seniors in high school who were concurrently taking freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior English because they hadn't earned a single English credit yet. My very next class period was college credit writing. And I had kids who had to pay money to be in my class. They were targeting elite universities. And so very early on in my uh, teaching tenure, I grew a very student-centered mindset. I think what it takes to serve kids well uh, who are struggling to get a diploma and what it takes to serve kids well who are destined for elite universities can be different. I'll, I'll talk more about this later but I tend to think about learning more like gardening than manufacturing. I think sometimes in our schooling systems, we think of learning to be more mechanical. Uh, we move kids through the system uh, based on how old they are, not necessarily based on their individual student learning needs. And I think if we think of it more like gardening, every kid needs a little bit more or less water, more or less sun, different kinds of soil. And I think we have to be sensitive to individual kids. Uh, I've also spent a lot of my career in assessment. Uh, some of you might be familiar with a product called Map Growth. Uh, that was one of my, my inventions earlier in my career. Or products called Atlas or Manage Back uh, when I was in the curriculum side. Uh, so as I bring my practitioner mindset from instruction, my assessment background, and my curriculum background, I'm more and more convinced that we need to spend more time focusing on how to learn, not just what to learn. And what I mean by that is the world is changing so fast. Uh, that anytime you have a point in time knowledge, uh, I think it can become obsolete quickly or it can be commoditized. And so if you think about, uh, you know, back in my day, we were thinking about calculators and spell check and then the internet and how that was changing what knowledge mattered. We're starting to move into generative AI and machine learning that's really going to change. Uh, 
uh, the way we think about what knowledge matters and, and how we approach it. So with a little bit of grace, I'd like to step back from STMAP and actually talk about what it means to equip students to solve the world's most challenging problems. And I loved what Alex said, like, I dare you to think of a challenge or a problem that doesn't involve math in some way. Uh, and having been married for 25 years, his, uh, his comments about love made sense to me. It can be expensive. So a uh, couple of key things. I'm going to go deep on Mind Education's mission because I think it's uh, new to some of you. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization, and I think sometimes describing what you are not is less helpful than describing what you are. And so I like to think of us uh, being for impact rather than being not-for-profit. Uh, so it really is, how are we making a difference for educators and kids? Um, I'm five months into my journey at Mind Education, uh, and I've always been a part of not-for-profit mission-driven organizations. So I've been thinking really deeply about our mission, and I'll share some of that with you. I do think it's time to evolve systems of learning and teaching. We really need to reimagine some things. Um, you know, some of our approaches to schooling are hundreds of years old, literally, and uh, we haven't really evolved out of that. I think the pandemic, if anything good came from it, it really did challenge us to create more resilient systems and get more creative. And if I think about some of the world's biggest problems, it's going to take communities and it's going to take global communities. So how we help kids solve problems across time and distance. Uh, the ST and ST math is spatial temporal. And so if we think about solving problems in the real world, it is also spatial and temporal. So I think we have to think differently about the skill sets we give to kids to truly solve global level challenges. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about how we intend to be a part of the solution. So we have an amazing foundation at Mind Education with ST Math. Uh, I am so impressed and proud of the efficacy data and the impact our products make, but I think it's the beginning, not the end. And so I wanna to talk to you about how we're planning to grow, evolve and expand over time uh, with our uh, products and services. So starting with our mission statement, uh, and you can see uh, the statement here, ensuring all students are mathematically equipped to solve the world's most challenging problems. And when I first joined the organization, a couple of words stood out to me, all being the first one. And so if you think about the commitment that takes to access, to equity, to opportunity, to fairness, and to representation, uh, serving all kids is an audacious goal. It is uh, even serving students with special needs alone, much less language uh, and other challenges. Uh, so that's that's the first challenge when I joined the organization. Think of how are we thinking about all kids from a design perspective from the beginning, not an afterthought. Uh, so thinking of universal design from the beginning is really important. The other is mathematically equipped, and but it's not for its own sake. And so I think the second part of the statement is really important, that why is math important? It's to equip kids to be able to solve the world's most challenging problems. And so I think sometimes we think of math in its own right, uh, multiplying fractions, right? But I think of it a little differently, which is how do we equip kids to have a conceptual understanding of mathematics so that they're actually equipped to be world-class problem solvers? Uh, because I think that's what our, our world will take. So what are the world's most challenging problems? I think that's worth a, a conversation. So take a moment in the chat uh, and come up with your top one or two. What do you believe the world's most challenging problems to be right now that we need to be preparing our future leaders to be mathematically equipped to solve? It's hmm. a good list. Good. So in the spirit of uh, the theme, a global digital challenge, I actually took a moment and just asked ChatGPT, what are the world's most challenging problems? And I was mostly curious to see if AI would say that AI is one of the most challenging problems. And uh, it did, actually. Um, so a couple that jumped out, and, and again, just to create a little participation here, I think it's a great way to think of how is math related to these problems. And, and I think there are obvious examples for all of them. Um, so if you think in terms of chat GPT, some of you mentioned this, uh, climate change uh, was one of the first ones. 
And I think if you just think about simple weather patterns, if you think about uh, engineering things to be resilient to, against climate change, I think there are lots of ways that uh, math is critical to helping solve that problem. Um, and just being data savvy is a critical aspect of it. Uh, the other one that came up was uh, food scarcity and poverty. And what you'll start to see is some of these problems are interconnected. So it's uh, it's not like climate change, for instance, and food scarcity are not related. And I think that's important to consider as we're preparing kids to solve these problems. They're not in isolation, right? They are complex, large, interconnected problems. Uh, geopolitical conflict uh, was another one. So whether it is challenges uh, with Russia and Ukraine or uh, uh, Palestine and Israel, or if you're looking at uh, Taiwan and some of the global tensions we have there, uh, preparing kids to be able to navigate uh, large-scale geopolitical conflict and be a part of the solution, that's going to require not only uh, mathematical knowledge in some cases, but the ethical application of mathematical knowledge, uh, which is where I think things like mathematical discourse and creating communities of mathematicians will be really essential for the next generation. Uh, some of you uh, alluded to this in, in the chat, equity comes up in a number of places uh, when you're thinking about this. And it's uh, not only equity in opportunity, but also equity in outcomes. And some of the definitions uh, and quotes that you all picked up on this morning from Alex, I think reinforce that. But if you think about economic, gender, race, faith, national uh, country of origin, and there are so many aspects of measuring outcomes, if you think about achievement gaps alone, right, the mathematics involved with understanding whether we're moving the needle on equity is a, a big deal. Uh, technology in general came up in, in the application of artificial intelligence uh, relative to it was sort of the largest factor there. And the timing was kind of interesting. There were uh, a couple of quotes that came out. Bill Gates uh, came out and just said, mathematics will be essential to putting guardrails on AI pointing algorithms toward relatable, reliable, and valid sources of truth are critical to AI doing good things and not bad things. Uh, and Sam Altman, he's the uh, CEO of ChatGPT. He actually said mathematics without ethics and values will enable AI to do very bad things. And so if you think about the context of understanding mathematics, but also putting it in a social context, I think that's very important. Uh, and, you know, the, the opportunity for misinformation and AI to do damage, you know, we've thought about it a lot with elections. I think some of you probably saw the robocall uh, that was imitating uh, President Biden's voice, encouraging people not to vote. Uh, we also had things like explicit images of stars like Taylor Swift using AI generated content. And so equipping students to use mathematics to actually search for truth and cut through misinformation, I think, will be an essential skill for our future. Uh, some of you mentioned this in the chat, refugee crisis, and how that relates to things like climate change and like food scarcity. I think that challenge will only continue to grow. And I'll, I'll withhold comments on uh, our current state of Congress and what they're trying to do with uh, immigration right now, or not do, depending on how you look at it. Uh, sorry, I went backwards. Uh, education funding and equitable education is one that comes up often. I don't think I need to elaborate that uh, with you all, but you think about the mathematics of funding models and how we look at funding education in a way that's equitable for all kids, I think is, is one of our challenges for the future. And then lastly, global disease and pandemic. And I think this resonates with everyone. Uh, what was sort of interesting on this is the level of specificity. So I remember when I was a kid, curing cancer was the big challenge that, you know, oh, we're, we're gonna cure cancer and create world peace. And if I look at that in the context of these problems, curing cancer seems eminently solvable for our kids in their future compared to some of the complexities of these problems. Uh, the point being the world is changing. Uh, so what are some of the themes we need to think about in preparing our kids to actually solve the world's most challenging problems? Uh, and I, I kind of like to speak to this from an employer uh, point of view. So when I'm hiring staff or thinking about building a team, the first thing I've started looking for is collaborative problem solving. So I want to hire people who know how to solve difficult challenges with other human beings. And so if we think about that in the context of mathematics, 
creating the mindsets and the tools to be collaborative when it comes to solving math challenges, I think will be very important. And you can even think about it in the context of this conference, right? We're in a, a digital virtual space. How do we create products and services that allow communities of mathematicians to engage in the same problem and to create discourse uh, within classrooms so students are talking about math, not just working on a worksheet in isolation, or even working on an ST math game in isolation, right? How do we create communities in that regard? Uh, I, I think this goes without saying, but rote knowledge and formulaic thinking, I think, are being commoditized and in a lot of ways automated. So critical thinking and creativity, and that's where I think conceptually understanding math is more important than ever. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you saw the film Oppenheimer, but there was a moment in it that really struck me where they had to do massive amounts of very large scale calculations with mathematics. And so they brought in a room full of women uh, who all had formulaic knowledge. So numbers would come in and numbers would come out and they were doing mass calculations. I don't think the mathematicians of the future will view rote knowledge and formulaic thinking as being success. I think it'll be rich and enduring conceptual understanding of mathematics. And how do you apply that conceptual understanding of mathematics to new problems? You know, uh, in my day, memorizing the Pythagorean theorem was considered a good thing. I don't need to memorize that anymore, right? And you, and you can put that in the context of history as well. When we used to think of the smartest historians, it was that they memorized dates and events. In the information age, I don't know that that has much value, right? We need to start thinking about power dynamics, culture, and other aspects of history that have more value. Uh, okay, so here's a little clip for you. I don't know, I might be dating myself here. I don't know how many of you remember the Jetsons. Uh, so this was a vision of what the future looked like from 1962 uh, in terms of preparing. And you can see uh, people flying, uh, all kinds of concepts in the Jetsons. But what you'll notice is the vision of school is still a physical building. Uh, you'll see it coming up here. There's the Little Dipper School. The classroom still has kids in desks and in rows, and there's even a chalkboard in the front. But the big difference is the teachers are robot. So I think as we are reimagining schools, we need to go way beyond what they were conceiving of with the Jetsons. And I don't think automating the human relationships, that was a part of Alex's point this morning, right? Relationships rule. Uh, I don't think we want to lose sight of how important those relationships are. So as we're reimagining, a couple of things I would challenge all of us to think about. Uh, how do we create curiosity so that learning how to learn is more important than learning specific knowledge and skills? Because I think point in time knowledge is going to move and change over time. But the kids, you know, if we think if learning and knowledge is power, right, you always hear knowledge is power. I think learning how to get new knowledge will be the new power. And so teaching kids to learn how to learn, I think, should be essential in developing that curiosity in our, our institutions. Uh, valuing questions over answers, right? Uh, student centricity. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit. We tend to move kids through the schooling system based on how old they are. And I gave you the example. I had kids uh, when I was teaching high school who were seniors in high school and couldn't read. I also had kids who were destined to have a full year's worth of college credit before they even left high school. And so imagining them having the exact same needs, uh, I, I think does not make sense. So we need to be more student specific and student centered. Even kindergarten readiness is a concept I would uh, challenge us to think about. So entering kindergarten, there are some kids that don't know that books open in a certain direction and they don't know what the letter A is. There are other kids that are already carrying around Harry Potter. And so thinking that starting the first day of kindergarten in the exact same way for all kids, I don't think makes sense for our future, but it's hard, right? So how do you scale student-centered ideas with teachers and make sure that we're maintaining rigorous standards for them all? Um, being learning focused and not just teaching focused. Uh, and so a lot of you are familiar with Mind Education's neuroscientific uh, basis. But I think we have to be more focused on how the brain works and not just focused on standards. And so I think standards are sufficient or not sufficient. They are necessary, but we need to go beyond just standards. 
And I think about that in the context, uh, this will date me a little bit too, but since the No Child Behind era and the standards movement, we haven't seen student achievement move much. We haven't seen achievement gaps move much. So I think we have to think differently about how we challenge those kids uh, and design learning and relevant learn uh, experiences that, that challenge their curiosity. And the last thing I would say is we need to demand efficacy in the products, services, and solutions that companies are providing to educators. So for all of you who make purchasing decisions, demand evidence that those solutions work. And I'll, I'll give you a picture here. Uh, some of you may have actually seen this in one of our sessions today. Uh, and this is uh, some of Mind Education's efficacy data. And a couple of things stand out for me. Uh, one is that it's efficacious for all kids. So whether it is talented and gifted, whether it's socioeconomic status, gender, uh, the effectiveness of the product for all kids is really important. And I would challenge all of you to make that a purchasing criteria. If you have a million choices for ed tech products out there, buy those that you know works. Uh, and beyond that, buy the ones that are efficacious for all kids not just subgroups of kids. Uh, so I, I really challenge all of us to think in that way. And if you think about ST math for a moment, why does it work for all kids? Well, it works for all kids because we have the same brains, right? If we can eliminate the barriers to access, like language, for instance, all kids can be math people and ultimately be equipped to solve the world's biggest challenges. Okay, so, a couple of research-based solutions to consider with this. Uh, and as you're thinking about math products and you think about these global challenges we're solving, we have to start thinking about big ideas in mathematics. How do we help kids apply mathematical skills, standards, and concepts to big ideas and big problems so they see math as essential and relevant to those challenges? Uh, second, emphasizing rich mathematical discourse, I just think communities are the key to solving the world's most challenging problems. So engaging students in dialogue around mathematics, not just engaging them in solving math problems, I think is really critical. We have to go beyond rigorous grade level standards. And so standards alignment, I think is the low bar for quality curriculum right now. And the question is, are these things designed to work for all kids uh, based on what we know of neuroscience and other factors? Uh, you know. Engaging learning experience, I think John Dewey had it right a long time ago. We have to engage kids in, in experiences that are more enriching, spark more curiosity and drive more questions. Removing barriers to access from the beginning uh, to enable students to see themselves as mathematicians. And a lot of this is, is relevant to uh, if kids can't see themselves in mathematicians and in their teachers, it's hard to see themselves as mathematicians and teachers. And so I think creating that culturally relevant connection where all kids see themselves in the math is really important. And we're working on some things at Mind that I think you'll be really excited about that'll help kids see their identity as being mathematically oriented. Um, productive struggle is important. So this is what I was talking about with uh, problem solving and collaborative problem solving. Developing models where kids are more resilient so that they gain confidence that they can solve math challenges. So if math is easy, then it won't generate the mindsets that they'll need for more complicated challenges later. So creating the right line where kids can productively struggle with mathematics, not get complacent, but not unproductively struggle where we're, we're shooting over their heads. Uh, and the last one I'm really passionate about because you know we have a national challenge with teacher shortages, uh, across the country. So we need curriculum products that amplify educators of all experience and ability levels. So if we're developing products that only work for master teachers, we're gonna be missing the mark for kids. I believe we can build products that actually amplify teachers' ability to be effective and embed professional learning in a, in a way that allows them to grow their effectiveness by virtue of using the product. Uh, so here's a quick map, uh, uh, kind of a, a mind map of how we think about some of our products and services at Mind Education. And there's a couple dimensions to this that I think are important. Uh, one, it's not just ST Math, right? We're at an ST Math Users Conference, but we have supplemental solutions like ST Math, summer programs, um, 
And I, I think that's uh, important for those of you who have tracked learning loss due to the pandemic and learning loss due to summer. We know that kids slide in the summertime, so we need solutions that can help during the summer. Uh, after school programs, we now have tutoring offering at Mind Education, teacher professional learning, our SD Math Champions program, uh, ed tech partnerships. So we have our assessment support tool that allows you to connect student assessment results uh, to their actions in SD Math so that we can look at growth and achievement relative to assessment outcomes. Uh, we have neuroscience and education research services. And then the last thing I really want to focus on is what's coming. And what we have coming is a product called Insight Math. And it's a, a brand new offering we're working on uh, for launch in 2025. And it is a core curriculum. So we are evolving and growing beyond our supplementary offerings. And I would say uh, to you that our mission compels us to do this. If we're equipping kids to solve the world's most challenging problems, we need to surround them with a rich ecosystem of products and services that help them do that. So uh, Insight Math, it's based on 25 years of math research in our organization, based on how the brain learns, uh, as I mentioned before, based on problem solving processes, because that, again, prepares them for that broader world, uh, creates student agency. Uh, I always think I used to be a literature teacher, uh, and so I used to teach David, David Copperfield. And it talks about uh, the opening line uh, being the hero of your own life. And I want to create a world where kids see themselves as the hero of their own life. Uh, content arranged through progression and big ideas. Again, it can't be concepts in isolation. Uh, integrated with what has made mind education great, which is ST Math, uh, with equitable access uh, to deeper learning for all kids. And again, still grounded in spatial, temporal, and conceptual understanding. Uh, so what does this include? It's a lot. Uh, so if you look at the, the breadth of what we're planning to bring uh, to the market in 2025, it'll include ST Math uh, and what has made us strong thus far. But we're going to expand to include teacher guided lessons, uh, both print and digital teacher guides, student playbooks, small group activities, alignment to big ideas, routines, tools, tasks, templates, family guides, assessments, student practice book. So you can see this will be a comprehensive core curriculum, uh, but it's a little different than what our competitors might, doing, uh, might be doing. A lot of our competitors have come from a large scale publishing world, right? So they're trying to take textbooks and make them digital. We're coming from the opposite side, right? We're taking gamification and enriching digital student learning experiences and wrapping that around that experience. So we're gonna take everything that's made us great and expand and grow it. There's a particular part of this that I think you'll find interesting and important, uh, which is the lesson experience. So there are a couple of components to this, uh, teacher facilitated lessons. And so you'll be able to uh, manage whole group instruction and learning from a digital experience. And a, excuse me, an interesting part of that will be the ability to pause student interactions get the group to come together and have a dialogue about the challenges and approaches to solving those problems, and then go back to, uh, to expand on independent work or student playbooks. What you can see here is this is a combination of digital, paper, and hybrid learning. And so students will continue to get a rich digital experience, which again, going all the way back to the beginning, I think is essential for our futures uh, because our kids will be operating in a global digital world but also has those components that they can use specifically in the classroom for paper. Um, I'm particularly excited about the playbook. Uh, we talk a lot about joy. How do we bring joy into the classroom and really creating fun problems to solve where they can uh, almost have a playground for mathematics and experiment with mathematics as opposed to always feeling like they have to have the answer. So I'm really excited to bring that piece to, to you all because it, it'll be fun. And I frankly think we need a little more fun in math. Uh, we're also designing this uh, to make sure we're allowing kids to see themselves in our curriculum. So uh, you can see a couple of examples of our little scholars here. And through our characters that will be built into this curriculum, we want students to see math as useful, valuable, and important to their lives. Um, characters will experience obstacles and events over time. And they'll have a, a rich backstory that will allow kids to make a connection to both the characters and the math problems they're trying to solve. 
uh, and it'll create positive growth mindsets and math identities and habits of mind. So by connecting to characters working through math, we believe we can really expand students' sense of identity as being like these characters so that they too are mathematicians who are capable of solving challenges and real world problems. Uh, wrapping up, uh, building a math community, and we are all math people. So uh, these photographs come from our Math Minds events. And this is such a nice tie in to what Alex was talking about, about building communities. And that includes families, right? How do we bring families into the equation so they're a part of the solution? And there's some really interesting research that's come out uh, where we've found that parents' math knowledge does not have a significant impact on student outcomes, but parents' math anxiety does. And so if you think about for that uh, for a minute, if we have parents at home who do not view themselves as math people or have anxiety about math, that has a bigger impact on their children's views on math than their parents' experience in mathematics. So the more we can bring parents and communities in and help them understand we are all math people, the better able they will be to pass that on to kids so that they can champion that effort going forward. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want to demystify math and make it fun. So uh, everyone is a math person. And to the theme of this event, everyone can learn by doing. And that includes our community members. So that's a whole lot of me talking. I, I appreciate uh, you, your endurance uh, and engagement with it. Uh, I wanted to close with a little thanks and gratitude. I really look forward to seeing you all uh, again soon. Hopefully face-to-face, -face, these virtual events uh, are, are great and necessary. And I think communities of practice and people getting together still really, really matter. So, uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. And Deb, I'll pass it back over to you.